In this video, I'm going to explain why we see music and speech and other significant sounds as visual phenomena when we take psychedelic drugs, and why we see angels and demons and other assorted archetypes in these states. In other words, why there is in fact a biological explanation for what our ancestors referred to as a spiritual realm. That realm is a kind of sense perception about the environment around us. And of course, this is speculation. Psychedelic drugs, like other things which reduce activity in the default mode network of the brain, give us a glimpse into our old perception and what it would have been like when we lived in the rainforest and experienced the world much more through instinct and much less through the rational style of thinking that pertains to that default mode network activity. And back then, we would see this psychedelic screen all the time, full of geometric patterns and Jungian archetypes. That would just be part of our normal perception. And what this layer of perception would do is very simple. It would make chemistry and sound that benefited us somehow register as visually or emotionally beautiful or appealing, and chemistry and sound which was neutral or bad for us register either as nothing or as something repellent to shoo us away. So to give you a couple of very simple examples about how this would work, if humans were eating a fungus into extinction, it could survive as a species if it evolved a chemical that caused humans to see a demon in their psychedelic screen. The humans would take this to be a physical entity, possibly the spirit of the fungus, and they'd run away accordingly. Conversely, if a plant or fungus wanted us around, if it wanted our manure or our ability to carry stuff, then the relational chemical spectres which would evolve in our consciousness when we ate its chemistry would be lovely benevolent hominid avatars. This is a way that the sovereignty and importance and role of each plant and fungus to the environment and to us could become legible. So although talk of things like plant spirits in the modern world just sounds made up, what I'm suggesting is, no, what we're seeing is a fragmented echo of this. This is an archaic sense perception and it's really the same as our other five senses, which also make good environmental things register as pleasant and bad things register as unpleasant. But this screen would have been a sense perception that was really quite linguistic in that it would use symbolic visual imagery that had evolved over generations to help us annotate our environment in a very detailed way. So why would this linguistic, symbolic style of perception come about in the first place? Well, it's not just that plants and fungi speak a different language to animals. It's more that they operate in a domain where the context and meaning of each to each other is harder for us to instinctively recognize. We have a natural instinctive understanding of the meanings of animals around us, we're naturally afraid when we see eight legs on a creature or sharp teeth, or when we hear a roar or a hiss. We find the sound of birdsong pleasant, however. We find we're moved to protect baby animals by finding them unbearably adorable. So here, we're not understanding the language of these animals when they're communicating with each other. We're understanding their meanings to us and how we need to relate to them. And our ability to do this is helped a lot by the fact the way they behave is very similar to how we do. So we've already got the apparatus in our brain to hear their calls to each other, to see their movements. And this kind of stuff helps us gauge their meaning to us. However, to instinctively understand the relationships that plants and fungi have to us in the way they understand their relationships to each other, we'd actually have to have dedicated pieces of brain that were plant-like or fungi-like themselves. So we could conceptualize them more on their own terms and you know what, why bother? It's a lot easier to just have their chemistry talk to our software or our visual cortex than it is to have dedicated hardware that we have to carry around. That way our software can give us an animal translation of what fungal and plant chemistry 
have proven to mean to us over the time we've been interacting with them. And what the resulting phantasmograms in our awareness tell us is a lot more complicated than just the ambitions of that individual plant or that fungus. I don't believe this is the plant or fungus speaking to us. What's speaking is the voice of the environment, which is telling us how to relate to these organisms in a way which benefits it as a whole. So to investigate this language of visuals even more, Let's look at its analogue in the physical world, because did you know there is a three-dimensional precedent for this kind of language? The eyes that appear on the wings of a butterfly are a spectre or a demon. They scare off potential predators by pretending to be a predator. The orchid that looks like a female bee, whose aim is to get the male bee to mate with it, that's a spectral lure, drawing the bee in so that it'll transport some of its pollen. The flowers, which are like the geometric portals we see in altered states, tell us to stay here or to come here, and that's something I'll talk about more later on. So this language of visuals is something that appears in the physical world too, and some people would say it's a language of manipulation because the bee is being conned. It doesn't get to mate with the flower it thinks is a bee, but in fact, the bee's being told what the environment needs, when it tries to mate, its pollination of that plant is maintaining the balance of the ecosystem upon which it relies in turn. So at a species level, the bee is playing a useful role and being correctly guided by the visual language to protect the endurance of its own species. And there are some instances, as I was talking about in episode one, where individual insects die in service to their species through the guidance of this visual or chemical language. So those individuals might feel a bit shortchanged, but those insects are Christ-like. They are dying for the good of their species in those examples. These symbols and chemicals always speak in service to the balance of the ecosystem. Otherwise, they simply wouldn't have been selected for. However, here's the thing. If I was to say to someone who's taken dimethyltryptamine, a substance that used to appear in our old staple diet of fruit and green leaves, that the spectres they saw were just lures and just scarecrows. They weren't part of a physical reality. They were just telling us what to do to make the environment work. These people, I think, would tell me I was wrong because that realm that they go to with DMT along with the entities that inhabit it seems more real than reality itself. But there are a few explanations for this. One that's to do with brain wiring, which we'll come to towards the end of this video. But firstly, let's consider why the psychedelic realm is so full of such realistic imagery, where this language, when it appears in the physical world, almost looks poorly realized by comparison. You know, the eyes of a predator that appear on the wings of a butterfly are not that realistic, to us anyway. I mean, they must be realistic enough if they work, but they don't look quite right because when these eyes appear like this, they have the same problem as billboard advertisers have. They are appearing to everything within the vicinity. So they have to cause the right reactions from all organisms they encounter in the round. They can't act as a scarecrow for one predator, but an accidental lure for another. And so these things don't seem as well rendered as they do in the psychedelic realm because they have this very tight niche in which to emerge to absolutely everything. A plant that wants to scare off humans might start evolving a demonic face within its foliage to make us think twice about eating it. But then that face could start scaring off the birds upon whose service it also relies. So that tactic wouldn't be selected for. The same goes for chemical repellents. It's not always possible to poison just one species without affecting your actual partners who you like if they have similar biology to what you're trying to kill off. So of course, a lot of this stuff does manage to emerge, but it does look fragmented to the human eye because it's strewn across the landscape in the different visual languages of the different animals that it's trying to speak to. Therefore, as internet marketers will tell you, there's a massive advantage for the evolution of some system whereby signals only occur in the minds of individuals and they appear differently in accordance with the different needs of each reader. 
So when these lures and these scarecrows appear in our minds, they are incredibly realistic in vision and behavior because they're written in the language of humans alone. They're written in human perception. And they've also got to appear real if they're going to be selected for. If they didn't affect our behavior, they just wouldn't be there. So animals do, as our human ancestors once did, go around within a personal matrix that tells them what's good and what's bad individually in an environment of immense physical complexity where such detailed and comprehensive instinctive understanding would otherwise prove very difficult. Now, just to reiterate, this is only a logical extension of what we already know because we know we go round in a personal matrix. We hear only the range of sound that we need to hear as a species. We see only the colors that we need to see. The colors appear differently to each different animal. And the only thing I'm adding is to say that our matrixes also contain a psychedelic layer of relational perception as well, with symbolic patterns and scarecrows and lures that ancient humans and other animals perceive as entities that are genuine pieces of reality. In the old days, it's likely these spectres would be quite uniform to those who saw them. But what we find now is our brains are populated with the artifacts of culture. So when this chemistry metaphorically presses the predator area of our brain, it may throw up a scary creature as it did in the past, or it may just throw up our own learned version of a scary creature or an assortment of our general fears, which is why there's an unintentional side effect here that's quite therapeutic, because these substances can show us forgotten and suppressed experiences that we didn't know we'd filed under fears and under joys. But in a sense, the old, more uniform spirits, in inverted commas, that we used to see looked real because they really were real. These are genuine avatars of plants and of fungi and of other things, which, as I said earlier, made us relate to the organisms in exactly the way we needed to, appearing scary to shoo us away, appearing as friendly hominids to, say, treat us as partners. And this is the time-based data forged by generational empiricism between our species and theirs. Over time, the visions and experiences thrown up in our minds would have varied. And then the ones that worked best to make us relate correctly, in other words, the maps that worked best to navigate the territory would have been the ones that became established. So this language, is a visualization of occurrences in the fourth dimension of time and let's say the fifth dimension of consciousness. But however you want to label this empiricism, as we might call it, it does appear within a dimension in which time seems flattened and static so that it's accessible beyond its normal presentation in our modern sober states. And so this data, constitutes gargantuan aspects of what we need to know about to function in sync with everything else. I mean, I can suggest another example of something you see very often in psychedelic states, which is a bit like the predator eyes that you see on the wings of a butterfly. Many people see an array of beautiful human eyes adorning all surfaces, and these are benevolent signposts that may be saying, treat the environment as though it's alive. Now, whether it's actually alive is neither here nor there in a way. The point is you have to act as though it is if you want to match the pattern of your behavior with the pattern of the environment's needs. So this is the voice of empiricism calling. This is, you could say, the voice of whatever it is that animates us, possibly the voice of what some people call God. And so although I've described this psychedelia as a language, as though it's just a film across our old awareness, you know, like an afterthought, really, I take it to be the richer part of holistic perception. Awareness is linguistic in itself. It's the ability of matter to make a copy of external signals within a conscious domain, a map, and then through inherited instinct feel compelled by these signals to act in a way that matter over time has found to be conducive to the balance of the whole. So where the laws of physics keep the movements of inanimate matter relatively stable, the laws of inherited perception or empirical temporal map making, if you will, keep those movements invoked by consciousness in sync with other conscious life 
developing in the vicinity. DNA is like a ledger system that tells you how to relate to your environment through this perceptual language that's been written by time and interaction. And different pieces of that perception in our DNA are activated by different chemistry within our environment. So a great deal of specialized brain chemistry that exists to describe things around us is manufactured outside the body within those things that require description. This psychedelia we used to perceive could also be the drawing board where biological behaviours were sketched, only later to emerge in three dimensions if they proved successful in that psychic domain. And given it's a domain made of time and of consciousness, I'm put in mind of Rupert Sheldrake's ideas about morphic fields. This could be something like that domain of ontology which informs what physically materialises later on. Hence why evolution appears to make progress much faster than we'd imagine if it was based on mere trial and error that we see in the physical world. Because there could be this other hidden realm in which this stuff is playing out additionally. Now, what of the geometric patterns? What do they mean when we see them? Well, they basically mean, as I said before, stay here or come here, and flowers are an echo of this. They attempt that same thing. And in the previous episode, I looked at how these patterns have physical properties that literally manipulate animal brains to make us stop where we are. They dial down our default mode networks using their physics to shift them out of rational thought and into an instinctive and somatic sense of relaxation. And it's that process that causes us to feel we're experiencing an overwhelming sense of beauty. And the result is that fungi and plants have evolved chemistry which induces these patterns in the minds of susceptible animals to help halt them where they are, so the fungi and plants can then use their services. So please do watch that video if you haven't already, because I go into the mechanism by which the patterns affect our brain. But the point of recapping that is to say that if chemistry can say stay here or come here using patterns, could sound once do the same thing? Because we see sound in altered states when our rational thought is dialed down. A lot of us see sound because we have synesthesia, a condition affecting about one in a hundred people. And then there's the fact that most of us would probably say high notes on the piano are sparkly and bright, whereas low notes on the piano are muddy and dark. Why? You know, so as a culture, we all seem to have it a bit. There's an arbitrary visualization of sound within us instinctively. And I would say, yes, we did once see sound because if you take something like birdsong, it would be incredibly useful if certain very specific songs were so beautiful to your perception, you wanted to follow them and stop where they were the loudest because some birdsong happens right next to the fruit that we want to eat. So if we were following these sounds instinctively because they were creating gorgeous visuals in our minds and we enjoyed it when those visuals became stronger and more detailed, this would be like some kind of visual GPS system that would lead us to fruit without us having to think about it rationally. And it wouldn't just benefit you to be around relevant birds when they happen to be eating fruit. Just living in the general area where they lived would mean you were in a place that would provide for you too. So if your screen had a pleasant buzz of beauty in it that was relaxing your nervous system, which came from very specific environmental signals from relevant birds and relevant insects, which is why the high notes are brightest and most easy to see, by the way, you'd know you were in a good area you would actually see the degree of a locale's abundance within your screen, and the effect of those patterns would be to relax your nervous system. So you might think, well, how come we don't just find that birdsong compelling to listen to so that we're drawn through the sound alone? And indeed, if you watched episode two, I've shown the way that patterned sound, which music is, also uses physics to dial down the default mode network in the same way visual patterns do, hence why we find music beautiful to listen to. So there is potential for sound to physically manipulate the brain out of rational thought and into the sense of beauty which halts us. But it's my guess that the visual element of sound we see in altered states and saw in our old perception evolved as a booster signal that was activated by only those sounds that were relevant to us. 
and this would therefore be absent when we heard sounds that were very, very similar to listen to, but were not relevant. And this is because in an oral environment where many sounds are very similar, we can't actually evolve a mechanical response to the physics of sound, which makes us relaxed, because that oral physics-based response would then be triggered by many other similar sounds and we'd be relaxing all over the place. And so the visual booster signal is a helpful secondary filter that brings in a halting pattern to our perception only when highly specific sounds are occurring. Is there really no other way to do this? Why not bring in a chemical booster signal? Why not release dopamine when highly specific sounds are detected? Because visuals are more immediate and can be dimmed and switched up in milliseconds in accordance with how the sound is evolving. So the sense and degree of pleasantness that results from the halting visuals is an incredibly uh, refined and detailed way of instructing the limbic system, stay here or come here. So that's some of the visual world of psychedelia explained from my perspective anyway. Let's just suppose it's 100% accurate. If it were, that would mean we are profoundly perceptually impaired. Without this accurate signaling, we don't know how to relate to things in a way which meets their needs and our own. And if you listen to the first two episodes, you'll know we can't just get this awareness back by taking psychedelics today. What they tell us is so context dependent, you have to take them in the environment in which they grow and also in an environment in which you've co-evolved closely alongside them for a long time. Otherwise, they're not going to be descriptive of that locale. Indeed, when the psychedelia started fading in our perception, we were immediately aware we had a problem. We didn't have the signals to tell us what things were like in the short term or how to maintain the health of our environment around us in the longer term. So our solution to this fading was religion, where we basically decanted the dying signals out into writing and artifacts so we could put together some instructions of how we believed we needed to relate to the environment around us. Therefore, it's crucially important we don't look down on our ancestors because that's just plain stupid. As archaeologists, we need to go back to ancient religious artifacts to see, oh, this thing seemed to have a spirit in the old days. Perhaps this thing had a spirit. Perhaps certain concepts and behaviors and attitudes had spirits in our ancient perception. Perhaps our ancient belief that the ancestors live on after death was a similar kind of perception to keep ancestral advice and working practices immediate in our awareness once the ancestors were no longer there to impart it. I mean, this is particular to humans who need to pass down and remember ways of surviving through culture rather than through instinct. But religion and art, so often heralded as the birth of creativity in humankind, actually formed a mere epitaph of that which was once internally beheld. And the reason these signals had to fade is something I'll talk about in much greater detail next time, but I can give you a summary now. Essentially, it was a case of us moving very fast to the savannah, possibly being forced out of the rainforest. We can see the speed of our move from the fact that we never lived on the savannah without the help of tools. And if we'd moved gradually, we'd have evolved into something more like baboons, so the tools wouldn't be necessary because our bodies would mirror the demands of that environment. So the fact that we needed to bridge that gulf between what the savannah required of us physically and what we were capable of physically using tools shows that we were short of this evolutionary time and would also have to make up some kind of perceptual bridge to uh, help with the gulf between what we needed to read about the savannah and what we could read about it through instinct. You know, all of our labeling in our existing perception evolved to annotate the rainforest. So all that labeling was suddenly out of date. And this was true not just for psychedelic imagery, but also the physical shapes. We could no longer read those anymore through instinct. You know, the shape of a scorpion in the rainforest isn't as scary as the shape of a spider, because scorpions there aren't poisonous. 
out here on the savannah though, the shape of a scorpion is suddenly deadly. So we have to start overriding our incorrect instinctive reading of that shape and supplant that wrong instinct with a learned concept, a learned symbol, and it would help to have a learned mouth noise or word so that we could itemize all the novelty together, communicate all this stuff and collectively catalog the uh, new things around us. And this formed our new made up language. And it wasn't just a language of speech, it was a language of thought. And you know what this means, we've got to start wiring our brains very differently. We've got to start diverting meaning making out of our right brain hemisphere. The right brain used to provide us with the context of the things that we saw. But with this context catalogue now out of date, ancient humans had to start overriding its offerings and constructing their own meaning consciously using the default mode network instead, either coming up with meaning from scratch through problem solving or from retrieving stored memories from previous experience. And memory is also part of the default mode network. This rewiring, which relies on DMN activity instead of cross-brain activity that pertains to instinct, is a process you can chart in the development of infants. Our brains start off in infancy as a lot more instinct-based. The wiring of a baby's brain looks like an adult's brain activity when they take LSD, because LSD dials down the default mode network, or when they take psilocybin or dimethyltryptamine. But then as we learn to think rationally, we lean far more into the default mode network than we lean into instinct so that our synaptic pathways get pruned down to favor this pattern of thought. And we take this to be normal brain development because other animals' brains get pruned down as they grow. But they're using their default mode network for facial recognition, for geographical mapping, for gauging speeds and distances between things, and for other basic problem solving. The rest of the world, they just read through instinct. Because we don't have that comprehensive instinct now, we're forced to use RDMN for the conceptual mapping of absolutely everything around us. There's very little in our environment that's instinctively legible. So what I'm suggesting is the process we go through is a little artificial and we have to suppress our old psychedelic way of thinking and wire in an unnatural way, which causes the cross-brain instinct networks to atrophy in the right hemisphere to become a little less active altogether. We get glimpses of our archaic mode of perception when the DMN is dialed down because our way of overriding psychedelia is being overridden in turn in those instances by chemistry. So those of our ancestors who overrode the mapping that pertained to the rainforest, those who could cancel that out best were the ones who survived. Of course, this new style of thinking using rational thought based on guesswork and limited empiricism instead of our old inherited instinct that was based on what actually worked across eons caused myriad problems. For one thing, as I mentioned earlier, our reality now seems a lot less realistic than the old psychedelic style of reality did. Just ask someone who's tried dimethyltryptamine, in a legal setting, of course. Or you could even ask someone who dabbles with meditation a bit. You know, these things give you a sense of perception that's a lot more HD. You can see this version isn't the best one, in a way. I mean, the other version doesn't correctly map the environment, as you can infer from what I've been saying, but it's a, a throwback to the way we used to feel and perceive the style of perception at the very least. Anyway, a more serious problem than that uh, perceptual showing off is that this is the very fall from grace described in our major religions. It's the point at which the instinctive pattern of our behavior no longer naturally matched up with the pattern of our surround. And the definition of morality itself is that the pattern of your behavior needs to match the pattern of the environment around you. So this is the fall the point at which the moral human has died because the only way we can live on is in a knowing state of sin or a state of confusion, as the Buddhists say. We now unwittingly harm the environment. It can't state to us its intricate needs anymore through that relational sense perception we once had. And I'll discuss that next time. In the meantime, please share this video with people you think might be interested. 
might be able to critique it, might have something to add, might have something they can do with it. And thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you next time.